UFO leaves behind a mysterious glowing ring. Its contrast to the soil in the center and the soil around it is remarkable. Strange pieces of metal are found in the human body after an alien encounter. But there's absolutely no inflammatory response by the body to the object, which is quote unquote impossible. An entire Mexican recovery team allegedly perishes when inspecting a UFO crash site. They were able to see there were a number of dead bodies, which led them to believe that something extraordinary had happened. And flying saucers are caught on film. The 1970s was an era of some of the most extraordinary UFO sightings ever reported. November 2nd, 1971, Delphos, Kansas. 16-year-old Ronnie Johnson was doing his chores on a small farm at approximately 6.30 in the evening. What occurs next changes Ronnie's life forever. As he's working, suddenly he hears a noise which sounds, he said, like a large out-of-balance washing machine. It was very loud, and the area lit up. And there, hovering about five feet above the ground, was an object some eight feet in diameter, the top of which was about ten feet above the ground. Ronnie watches in fear as the glowing, multicolored object lingers above the ground. Toward the end of this period, the brightness of the object increased, the sound increased, and the glow at the base of the object increased. And the glow appeared to be like a shimmering steam that was falling from the base toward the ground. And as he watched, it flared up in brightness and it blinded him as it took off. He could hear the sound receding to the south slowly and finally uh, re started regaining his vision, ran to the house, told his parents. They ran outside, also saw the object. After they observed the object in the sky, the Johnsons walk over to where the young boy had said the craft was hovering. The family is astonished by what they see. They saw this big luminescent ring in the ground and luminescence on the trees nearby. So they ran to the house and they drug out the old Polaroid camera. And it had one image left. And they went out and she took the only photograph I've ever seen of a luminous sight taken within 10 minutes of the ascent of an object. This is the actual Polaroid photograph taken by Ronnie's mother, Irma Johnson. After photographing the glowing ring, the family quickly realizes that there is much more to discover. Ron's parents both touched the newly deposited substance that was released by this UFO, and immediately their fingers became numb. Mrs. Johnson touched her leg with her hand and her leg became numb. Frightened by the physical effect on her body, the family continues to survey the property for additional clues to what could possibly have happened. The only round end of this area is around seven inch diameter tree that was lying on the ground. The previous afternoon, the tree was upright and fine. Did the mysterious craft knock down the tree? The Johnson family is left clueless. The next day, Sheriff Ralph Inlow launches an investigation on the property. When the sheriff arrived and he went out into the site, he was the first one to notice a broken tree limb, which was broken eight and a half feet above the ground and initially had projected out over the edge of the ring. So he decided, well, probably this is broken back and downward because of an object or a solid something that went in there. Sheriff Inlow also discovers a mysterious residue inside the ring. And by that point in time, the ground surface of the ring was a pure, pure white crust, very hard. 
and as shows up in the photograph, its contrast to the soil in the center and the soil around it is remarkable. Perplexed by his findings, Sheriff Inlow collects soil samples and locks them in his office safe. Four weeks later, word of the Delphos incident reaches Northwestern University astronomer and U.S. government UFO consultant, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. As early as the 1960s, Dr. Hynek believed that physical evidence is the key to solving the UFO enigma. Intrigued, he sends his colleague Ted Phillips to investigate. When I arrived at the farm, I talked to the witnesses briefly and they took me out to the side of the ring, uh, which was a mud bog. And to my amazement, here in this black, wet, sloppy, water-retaining soil, was a perfectly outlined ring of snow, unmelted snow, and totally covered, just the ring. And it was an amazing thing to see, so I shot a lot of photos of it. <laughs> the unmelted snow is a startling piece of evidence in Phillips' investigation. The ring at the landing site is hydrophobic or water repellent. Something has affected the soil. Well, this is very significant because uh, the same thing has happened in a lot of cases where UFOs have landed or nearly landed. They have changed the soil and changed the plant life so nothing grows. Phillips methodically approaches Delphos and other cases with the precision of a crime scene investigator. In a crime scene investigation, the predominant theory is that you cannot walk into a crime scene and leave without taking something with you and or leaving something behind and it's up to the investigator or the crime scene tech to find out what that was. Same thing holds true in a UFO incident. So the first thing you do is photograph everything before you disturb any part of the crime scene. And so after I had done all the necessary photography, I started laying out lines and getting measurements to get the exact size of the ring. After I had gone thoroughly over the ring, I started looking over the other area with the family kind of taking me, okay, this happened here, this happened there. Phillips also scrutinizes the Polaroid photograph taken by Mrs. Johnson. I tried many times to reproduce the Polaroid image shot that night. It's just not possible. I've tried everything, and again, using the same camera, the same film, same lighting conditions, with and without flash, and uh, it's, it's just not possible. Intrigued by his findings at the site, Phillips returns to Dr. Hynek with nearly 40 pounds of soil samples and more than 100 photographs. <laughs> Armed with the new Delphos evidence, Dr. Hynek enlists the help of a few scientists to obtain a valid and unbiased scientific opinion on the case. They conclude that the soil of the Delphos ring was considerably different from the normal ground soil. But the next breakthrough in the Delphos analysis doesn't come for more than 20 years. When Ted Phillips meets analytical chemist Phyllis Buddinger. In 1999, Buddinger studies the evidence at her Frontier Analysis Laboratory in Chagrin Falls. Buddinger is surprised that the soil remains hydrophobic or water repellent decades after the event. She recreates the experiment in her laboratory and her results are exactly the same. Okay, I'm going to show you that the Delphos ring soil is still hydrophobic after all these years. I'm going to add these approximately the same amount of water. The water extract on the top is a much darker color than that of the control sample. So clearly something has been extracted. On subsequent trips to the Delfo site over a period of 10 years, Phillips notes that the ring on the ground remained visible and that no new plant life was able to grow. Although researchers cannot explain why they believe the craft made the soil hydrophobic, Buddinger offers a scientific explanation for how. There was uh, organic material coated on the surface of the soil that made it hydrophobic. 
and this organic material was identified by myself as fulvic acid. Fulvic acid is a naturally occurring substance found in the ground during plant decomposition. It can cause soil rejuvenation and can be an excellent supplement to fertilizer. Although fulvic acid is found naturally in soil, Buttinger believes the amount of it in the Delphos ring is anything but natural. Fulvic acid would not be in the concentrations that is naturally occurring. It was added. It was a, it's part of a release of something. There is no natural explanation for these high levels of fulvic acid in the soil. I really don't know where it came from. This unexplained release of fulvic acid is not the only abnormality that Buttinger discovers in the Dolfo soil sample. High levels of oxalic acid, which is a known skin and eye irritant, are also found to be present in the soil. Oxalic acid could account for the numbing effects on Mrs. Johnson's fingers and leg that lasted for the remainder of her life. The Delphos incident and the altered soil baffle investigators, but this is not an isolated incident. Throughout the 70s, UFO sightings terrify witnesses the world over. One in particular would defy the known laws of physics. All the people are screaming, and it's hovering there 10 feet above the ground. The mysterious glowing ring in Kansas is just one UFO case from the 1970s. There are several more. In fact, what separates the 70s from other decades is the abundance of physical evidence these UFOs left behind. And for experts like Ted Phillips, many of the claims are credible enough to support the reality of UFOs. And in the hundreds of cases I've personally investigated, uh, my conclusion is that we're dealing with a device under the control of something intelligent. And that's obvious by the things that they do. The way they maneuver into a landing site, out of it, a number of things. September 1st, 1974. Langenberg, Saskatchewan, Canada. For farmer Edwin Furr, a routine chore turns into one of the most frightening experiences of his life. Furr observed this object near the ground. He stopped and went over very close to it. And he could see it was metallic looking. It was flat on the bottom. It was domed on top. It was hovering uh, just a foot or so over the ground. And he's 15 feet in daylight away from an object no sound. It's spinning, rotating at a very high rate. In the surface of this thing, he said it had a very old and used up appearance. And in it, he could see dark sort of grooves. At the base, he could see a sort of wide belt that went around the lower section. Shocked at what he encounters, Fur slowly retreats back to his tractor hoping to escape from the object. As he climbs back on, his shock turns to terror when he realizes it's not just one UFO, but an entire fleet. And he could see there were four more, and they were sort of equidistant from each other in a semicircle around the high grass. All same type of objects, same configuration, same color, all rotating. The ground, or the crop, underneath the object was spun in a spiral. And the plants were rotated and knocked down underneath each one of these. After hovering in the field for a few minutes, the objects begin their ascent. The objects ascended silently, vertically, in a step formation. Object one, two, three, four, five. And as they ascended vertically, silently, he could see beneath each object two vent-like extensions out of which there came a six-foot-long plume of gray material. Shortly after, the objects disappear. 
After Fur's encounter, Constable Ronald Morier of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police receives word of the event and visits the Fur property. The physical evidence that he discovers puzzles the investigators. Here were five rings, all swirled, compressed, in the same direction, all counterclockwise. And the central area in each of the rings was unaffected. The grass was standing up normally. And their sizes ranged from 8 foot in diameter to 11 feet in diameter. And Moyer's conclusion, after a full and extensive investigation, impressed me considerably. He said, this really happened, and whatever made these rings came out of the air and left the same way. And that pretty well says it. Investigators have still not produced a single logical explanation. October 8, 1978. Cato, Missouri. A grandmother and her grandchild spot a mysterious object in the field. An object that doesn't belong there. She could see an oval white something sitting in the field. And I found later that this was about 185 feet from the house. And so she called her husband. He called his son. And it wasn't doing anything. It was just sitting there. The neat part is they came up with the explanation that it must be a piece of metal that blew in there in a storm. So they didn't say it's a UFO out there. They said, you know, something's in our field and it shouldn't be there. We got to get it out. The father starts his track to move the object. But something strange suddenly occurs. The object leaps about 10 feet straight up into the air. And this thing is only like four feet in diameter. And all the people are screaming. And it's hovering there 10 feet above the ground. Without a sound, the object then begins an ascent away from the property. Not fast, just kind of cruising. No sound at any time. And the object is rotating. No wings, no engine, no visible means of support. It continues its climb. It makes a definite right turn, which I find later is across the wind. Flies to the right slightly for a few feet. Makes a very strong left turn across the wind. Another right turn and continues to climb. As the object increases elevation, the witnesses report that it merges with a second, much larger cylindrical-shaped UFO in the sky. And the cylinder flies away at a pretty good rate of speed. And so the farmer and his son walked to the spot where the object had been. And they arrived there to find a four-foot area of dehydrated plants. And the whole site already has turned a very dead, wilted brown. The physical characteristics left behind by the UFO are startling. This photograph, taken only a few minutes after the event, proves to investigators that something unexplained took place on the farm in Cato. The site basically is oval. The grass immediately surrounding it is lush green, perfectly healthy. Not another spot in the entire field that looks like this area. And at the outside edge of the site, near these two little impacted craters, bull nettle plants, which are large leafed, very tough plants. The leaves were not burned, but they were drawn up tightly as though some kind of heat generated and they closed up. But there was an additional scientific anomaly that investigators have yet to explain. The craters were about an inch and a quarter deep in some very hard soil. So I don't know if, it, if this occurred on landing or if it occurred on ascent. This discovery could be evidence of the craft's propulsion disturbing the Earth. But no sound was ever heard at any time indicating any kind of propulsion system. And yet it had to exist for this four-foot object to cross the wind three times. And in the 70s, 
no human technology existed to produce a silent, functioning aircraft. In the course of UFO investigations, evidence consists mostly of physical effects left at the scene. But in 1979, a mysterious object not only leaves physical evidence, it nearly kills a Minnesota deputy sheriff. And almost instantaneously, that light went right from like a mile and a half away to right in his face. And he ended up crashing the car. August 27th, 1979, Warren, Minnesota. It was a routine patrol for Deputy Val Johnson, but at 2.19 a.m., his life would suddenly change. He sees a light off in the distance on an adjacent road, blacktop highway, two-laner, and figures that it may be a small aircraft with a landing light coming in to make an emergency landing. So he turns down that road to see if he can render assistance. And almost instantaneously, that light went right from like a mile and a half away to right in his face. And he ended up crashing the car. After the crash, police dispatch receives a call for help. One of the law enforcement officers who saw the damage firsthand was Marshall County Sheriff Herb Morstead. Sheriff Morstead, a deputy at the time, vividly recalls the night of the encounter with the actual car from the event. And Bell Johnson was still in the car. He was dazed and seemed kind of confused, didn't know for sure what had happened to him. And uh, there was considerable damage to the car that was documented at that time. He was driving a Ford LTD, and you don't damage an LTD with some little trivial thing. There was quite an impact. The physical damage to the car baffles the investigators on the scene. To look down, first damage was done to the headlight of the car. It's busted. It's in the original condition it was from that night. The interesting thing is you can see by looking at the headlight, there's no deer hair or debris or anything in there that would explain how the damage was done. And then as you move up on the car onto the hood, there's a round dent in the hood. And further up on the windshield is busted and cracked quite severely. Again, there's no evidence of any rocks or debris or anything that would have broke this windshield. And further on in the car up on the roof, there's one of the lens from the warning lights is busted. And behind that are the two antennas that were damaged. The interesting part on these antennas was right where the antenna bends, there were bugs attached to that antenna, which would indicate that nobody could have physically or used a tool to bend that antenna because they would have had to disturb those bugs. The effects of Deputy Johnson's alleged UFO encounter go beyond the damage to his police cruiser. Later on, the investigation continued. Val Johnson was found to have had what they call welder's burn to his eyes, supposedly from the light that he had encountered. One of the other things that was curious is the watch on his wrist and the car clock both stopped for 14 minutes. That's kind of an interesting piece of evidence for what most people don't know, though, a lot of cops will synchronize their watches with dispatch, the car clock, and then their private timepiece, so that all three were operating at the same time, so that in the course of your night, you made notations in reference to a case that it would be as accurate as possible. I wish I knew what happened during the 14 minutes that these two timepieces were affected. But there is, again, a, a lot of room for speculation, scientific speculation, of what happens when a person's involved in, in something like this. Current law enforcement officers have no doubt about Johnson's story. Well, I believe Officer Johnson, uh, when he was working as a deputy, uh, I believe he was honest that night. He just he sold the facts. 
Val Johnson was a good, honest man, a good deputy sheriff. And I have no reason not to believe him. When an officer comes forward with a story of an encounter, he or she risks everything. Their career, their personal life, maybe their marriage, their family. They're putting it all on the line. Phillips has now reopened his investigation into the Minnesota encounter in hopes of finding out what really happened in the early morning hours of August 27th, 1979. May 30th, 1978. This UFO incident stands out because it reportedly left its physical evidence implanted in one of the witnesses. Tim Cullen and his wife Janet are driving north near Highway 59 when they encounter what they believe is a UFO. They only recall staying at the scene for a few minutes. When they return home, they discover that they have been gone for more than an hour. Twenty years later, a routine x-ray reveals an unexplained piece of metal in Tim's arm. Cullen traces it back to that spring night, 1978, and contacts Dr. Roger Lear. I am a UFO hunter, and my job is to pursue research in this very tiny slice of a very strange phenomenon. I've been a practicing podiatric surgeon for 41 years. I have uh, performed uh, research in a number of medical fields, and now I've applied uh, my skills in science to the alien abduction physical evidence phenomena. Dr. Lear takes Tim Cohen's call. First contact was just telling me who he was and that he thought he might be associated with the abduction phenomena and that he had uh, a metallic object in his arm. So we had him send the x-rays and we looked and certainly there was a foreign body there which appeared to be metallic. What you are seeing is the actual surgery which took place on February 5th, 2000. Dr. Lear supervises the procedure to remove the foreign object from Tim Cohen's arm. Although there is no original entry scar, a six millimeter metallic object is found under the skin. Once the object was removed, we find two very surprising things. One is that there's absolutely no inflammatory response by the body to the object, which is quote-unquote impossible. And number two, we find that there's a large number of uh, nerve cells there that uh, really don't belong in that particular area. And these nerve cells are called proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are an active living cluster of nerve endings. They are normally located in the hands and feet and respond to touch, temperature, and pressure. According to Dr. Lear, there is no medical explanation for them to be connected to a foreign piece of metal in the human body. When we look at what happens in the body after the object goes in, the body does not like uh, foreign things inside, so it reacts to it. <laughs> Now, if it's, let's say, lead from a pencil or something like that, we get an immediate inflammatory reaction. But when we look at these things, there's nothing. Zip. Zero. So just from that alone, these are drastically different uh, than any kind of uh, typical foreign body that we get inside. I believe that these nerve cells uh, are sort of the plug where this thing is plugged in at, and it's using neural energy from the body to operate. On one case, uh, not Tim's, but on another case, we fortunately had a piece of equipment which was a radio frequency detector. And we actually detected two oscillating frequencies that were being emitted from the object. When they are removed, they don't do anything. So obviously, uh, plugging them in somewhere into the body gives them some kind of energy that uh, makes them do whatever it is they do. Dr. Lear has supervised more than 10 of these operations. Each surgery has produced strange foreign objects from the body. The evidence collected by Dr. Lear seems to defy scientific logic. We find that these objects contain metals which are not from this earth. The abundant amount of physical evidence available leads me to believe that this planet is being visited by intelligences from somewhere else. And some say that one of these alleged visits in northern Mexico turned deadly.
they were able to see there were a number of dead bodies, which led them to believe that something extraordinary had happened. The 1970s witnessed baffling UFO phenomena from a glowing ring in Kansas to a foreign object lodged in a man's arm. August 25th, 1974, Coyame, Mexico is home to its own mysterious and some say lethal UFO incident. It is a place not found on many maps and is home to more agave plants than people. But several of those who do live here claim the following event is real. It's a quiet summer's night in Koyame. The town's inhabitants are beginning to turn in for the night. 500 miles away, United States air defense systems suddenly register an unknown object flying over the Gulf of Mexico, streaking across the sky at over 2,500 miles per hour at an altitude of 75,000 feet. Only one thing is for certain. This is not something man-made. Initial indications are that it's probably nothing more than a meteor. But 60 seconds later, it becomes clear that's impossible. This object was traveling and descending through steps, unlike that of a meteor again, that would more of an arc. The object appears headed on a course towards Corpus Christi, Texas. American air defense systems are alerted. Suddenly, the unidentified flying object veers left and enters Mexican airspace, just 40 miles south of Brownsville, Texas. The U.S. continues tracking the puzzling spacecraft as it now races over Mexico. Yet what isn't seen on radar is a small craft headed on a trajectory towards the UFO. What's also interesting about this case is about the same time as this UFO was zigging and zagging, there was a plane that was leaving El Paso headed towards Mexico City. The small civilian plane from El Paso heads towards Mexico's capital city, but never reaches its destination. At the same time, the American military watches as their unidentified flying object disappears from radar. It appears that the unthinkable has happened. There's an assumption that there was a collision of some type where uh, both the craft and the plane had collided. The following morning, nine hours after the civilian plane disappeared over the desert, a Mexican recovery team hunts for the downed craft. Across the border, American intelligence listens in. The Americans intercept a Mexican military radio report. The wreckage of the missing plane has been spotted just outside Koyami. Moments later, another report shockingly announces the sighting of a second wreck. But this is no plane. The Mexican recovery team finds a, a sort of a silver-shaped classic disc, some 16 feet 5 inches, about 5 feet thick, convex on both sides, sort of like a saucer. The saucer's surface has the appearance of polished steel. It has no markings, no lights, and there are no bodies inside. However, it does appear to be damaged in two spots, possibly caused by a collision with a civilian plane, and then falling to the ground. Immediately, Mexican officials declare a radio silence on all search activities. Meanwhile, U.S. officials reach out to the Mexican government, offering assistance in the recovery. Their offer is met with a denial. The Mexican government denied it. They said, no, all we have is just a plane wreckage. While the Mexican team collects the crash debris, the United States is busy assembling their own elite recovery force at Fort Bliss, Texas. The team includes four helicopters, three small Hueys, and a large sea stallion. The team is placed on standby while U.S. surveillance scopes out the situation. The U.S. was keeping tabs again through its uh, spy, well, what I call the spy surveillance network, um, through their satellite uh, surveillance as well as uh, airplanes that were flying over at low altitude. American surveillance reveals that the Mexicans have placed the UFO on a flatbed truck and moved from the crash site. 
Then some say satellite photos were taken that reveal a startling discovery. The Mexican convoy has stopped and something has gone wrong. They were able to see there were a number of dead bodies, so which led them to believe that something extraordinary had happened. U.S. officials greenlight their rescue team. Four helicopters depart Fort Bliss. One of the things that seems obvious in this case is that, that the government, the U.S. government, responded very expertly, very quickly, and very organized. They had this team that assembled in Fort Bliss, and in no time were down there on site recovering this. They've done this before. But nothing will prepare the Americans for what they are about to find. Dressed in bioprotection suits, the American soldiers approach the silent convoy and find all the Mexicans dead. There is no time to investigate what killed the Mexican team, but UFO researchers have their theories. They somehow came in contact with a, uh, a lethal agent, a bacteriological agent that was um, from out of this world or an extraterrestrial biological agent of some sort that killed them, uh, which is my favorite theory. The U.S. recovery team quickly tends to business. It finds the 16-foot wide silver UFO strapped to the back of a flatbed truck. The straps are reconfigured and connected to a cargo cable from the Sea Stallion helicopter. Safely secure, the estimated 1,500-pound disc is lifted up and headed back to the U.S. With the saucer gone, the team immediately turns their attention to the remaining evidence. The plane wreckage, vehicles from the convoy, and Mexican team bodies are gathered. They gathered the debris, the bodies from the Mexican recovery team, and then they exploded them with high explosives. The reason why is to hide the evidence. Their work done, the recovery team heads back to base. Where the UFO was taken is unknown. Some have speculated Atlanta, Fort Bliss, or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. If this 1974 UFO crash was real, there was no evidence to prove it. But on the other side of the world, an Australian television crew actually caught a UFO on film. This is the flashing light that you have to slow down and look at frame by frame to see what happens when you go from very bright white down to dim orange. UFO sightings were prevalent throughout the 70s, but one particularly close encounter was actually caught on film. December 21st, 1978. Cargo plane pilots John Randell and Keith Hine observe a strange light phenomenon over the sea near the South Island of New Zealand. The same objects are picked up by Wellington, New Zealand air traffic control radar. Reports reach the local media. Ten days later, on December 31st, producers at Australia's Channel 10 dispatch reporter Quentin Fogarty with a camera crew who attempt to find these same UFOs along the exact same flight path. We're now in the radar room at Christchurch Airport. It's about uh, quarter to two, and in about another 20 minutes, uh, we intend to take off again in the Argosy and uh, retrace the route we took only a few moments earlier. Uh, we've just heard from Wellington Radar that there are still targets in the Kaikoura area. So this time we're hoping to get better film than we did last time and uh, all I can say is we'll see what happens. The New Zealand case is of considerable importance in the history of ufology because of the residue of information that's available afterwards. We have the film itself and the tape recordings made by Quentin Fogarty on the aircraft and of prime importance is we have the tape recording made by the Wellington Air Traffic Control Center and it provides a history of the sighting minute by minute. We're about now three minutes out of Christchurch Airport and on our starboard side we can see two very bright lights, one much brighter than the other and it's like a very, very bright star and just below it is another light not quite so bright. Just before midnight, Fogarty goes airborne with New Zealand cargo pilot Bill Startup. The beginning of the flight is uneventful. Then at 12.05 a.m., Fogarty and the crew see strange lights and objects coming toward them from the right side of the plane. Fogarty turns on his camera and begins filming. 
Those two lights appear to be travelling with us. They're still off the starboard wing. The brighter light is still above the other and uh, it's moved a little further ahead of the other. It was extremely bright, much brighter than any of the other stars in the sky. Ground radar observes these objects and the control tower confirms the sighting and records the conversation. What follows is the actual audio of this unusually well-documented event. The storm target showing that uh, left the clock at three miles. Captain Startup recounts that the object or target is initially ahead of him, then travels at an unbelievable speed past his left side. He quickly banks the plane left in an attempt to make visual contact. On the ground, Wellington Air Traffic radios a chilling message to the captain. They've picked up yet another target on his left side, and this one is closing in on the plane. over towards the right of the aircraft and we have an object confirmed by running to radar. It's been following us for quite a while. It's about four miles away and it looks like a very faint star but then it emits a very bright white green light. Captain Startup is able to get close enough to determine that the object is an array of bright blue lights pulsing at a rapid rate. To his shock, the object has gotten bigger. There was an interesting radar event where the uh, object, some object, got so close to the aircraft it looked to Wellington radar as if the aircraft radar target image had doubled in size. Strong target, uh, right in formation with you now. Uh, your target has doubled in size. The double size target continues to appear on radar screens for 36 seconds, then returns back to normal size. Yeah, blue lights right there. This is the object which was. Uh, Apparently traveling along with the aircraft, it was picked up on aircraft radar. Bruce McAbee received a 16 millimeter copy of the Argosy UFO film directly from the Australian TV network in 1979. Roll four, take ten. Experts believe that these images are some of the most comprehensive and frightening UFO evidence ever captured on film. This is the famous New Zealand film obtained uh, the night of December 31st, 1978. The cameraman is sitting in the seat between the pilot and the co-pilot. The image is dancing around because he was carrying it on his shoulder. They saw this light to their right. And this light, as time goes on, will fade in and out, takes on various shapes. This is the flashing light that you have to slow down and look at frame by frame to see what happens. When he goes from very bright white down to dim orange, you can see the image went over to the side, then he turned the camera a little bit in order to pull it back into the center. Uh, other target that has been following us has now been joined by two others. So we now, at this stage, have uh, three unidentified flying objects just off our right wing. And they've been following us, or one of them has been following us now for probably about 10 minutes. I, for one, am hoping that we've uh, seen enough tonight and uh, the rest of our journey back to Berlin will be uneventful. I think I've been back enough with UFOs for one night. For one decade. The 1970s was an era filled with claims of UFO sightings throughout the world. From US highways to North American farms. To the skies of New Zealand. Are they hoaxes, tricks, or figments of the imagination? Or is intelligent life just beyond our grasp? The brightness of the object increased, the sound increased, and the glow at the base of the object increased. And the glow appeared to be like a shimmering steam that was falling from the base toward the ground. And as he watched, it flared up in brightness and it blinded him as it took off. He could hear the sound receding to the south slowly and finally uh, re started regaining his vision, ran to the house, told his parents. They ran outside, also saw the object. After they observed the object in the sky, the Johnsons walk over to where the young boy had said the craft was hovering. The family is a
astonished by what they see. They saw this big luminescent ring in the ground and luminescence on the trees nearby. So they ran to the house and they drug out the old Polaroid camera and it had one image left and they went out and she took the only photograph I've ever seen of a luminous sight taken within 10 minutes of the ascent of an object. This is the actual Polaroid photograph taken by Ronnie's mother, Irma Johnson. After photographing the glowing ring, the family quickly realizes that there is much more to discover. Ron's parents both touched the newly deposited substance that was released by this UFO. And immediately their fingers became numb. Mrs. Johnson touched her leg with her hand and her leg became numb. Frightened by the physical effect on her body, the family continues to survey the property for additional clues to what could possibly have happened. The only route into this area is around seven inch diameter tree that was lying on the ground. The previous A UFO leaves behind a mysterious glowing ring. Its contrast to the soil in the center and the soil around it is remarkable. Strange pieces of metal are found in a human body after an alien encounter. But there's absolutely no inflammatory response by the body to the object, which is quote unquote impossible. An entire Mexican recovery team allegedly perishes when inspecting a UFO crash site. They were able to see there were a number of dead bodies, which led them to believe that something extraordinary had happened. And flying saucers are caught on film. It looks like a very faint star, but then it emits a very bright, white, green light. The 1970s was an era of some of the most extraordinary UFO sightings ever. This afternoon, the tree was upright and fine. Did the mysterious craft knock down the tree? The Johnson family is left clueless. The next day, Sheriff Ralph Inlow launches an investigation on the property. When the sheriff arrived and he went out into the site, he was the first one to notice a broken tree limb, which was broken eight and a half feet above the ground and initially had projected out over the edge of the ring. So he decided, well, probably this is broken back and downward because of an object or a solid something that went in there. Sheriff Inlow also discovers a mysterious residue inside the ring. And by that point in time, the ground surface of the ring was a pure, pure white crust, very hard. And as shows up in the photograph, it's contrast to the soil in the center and the soil are reported. November 2nd, 1971, Delphos, Kansas. 16-year-old Ronnie Johnson was doing his chores on a small farm at approximately 6.30 in the evening. What occurs next changes Ronnie's life forever as he's working suddenly he hears a noise which sounds he said like a large out of balance washing machine it was very loud and the area lit up and there hovering about five feet above the ground was an object some eight feet in diameter the top of which was about ten feet above the ground Ronnie watches in fear as the glowing, multicolored object lingers above the ground. Toward the end of this period,